uh, just start this video with a uh, thank you. Uh, I can't remember the student. I can't remember who it was. Um, they taught me uh, what the word many means. Uh, it really does mean a lot. So thank you for that. Right. Um, today's video. Urban Regeneration Project in our city of Plymouth. We should hopefully all remember it's Vision Plymouth, uh, the overall name for it. We'll answer those two bullet points in this video. Before we get into uh, the regeneration itself, just going to show you this uh, line graph. Is the population of Plymouth through time? Obviously missing the um, x-axis there, which should say date. Hopefully you can identify since 1801, obviously the population of Plymouth has increased, although there have been fluctuations and also areas of decrease within this graph. Just to point out, you've got a massive, massive spike here from about 1901 to about 1910. Uh, a massive increase in the population of Plymouth, which then declined quite severely due to um, World War I and the posting of people abroad. Since that time, uh, we've also got another little decline, just to make you aware, for uh, the Second World War around about 1941. would be a nice place to drag up and see that decline. Since that date, although the, um, there has been a decline in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, Plymouth's population has increased from um, the population that it was at the end of World War II. Today, the population is about 260-ish thousand, so you can see that trend has continued to increase into 2018. The city's um, redevelopment plan, or the hope, is to rise or raise the population, I should say, up to 300,000 by 2030. So the population of Plymouth at the moment is increasing, uh, although in the past it has fluctuated. We will certainly be talking about this uh, with the graph in the uh, early uh, mid 90s with this decrease in this video. As I already said, your regeneration project or redevelopment project is vision for Plymouth. Key word there, it's called a regeneration project. Remember, regeneration means to maintain existing structures, but to change or improve the usage of them. Really, this should really be called a redevelopment project on the basis that there is wide scale removal of buildings and, and rebuilding. Um, for example, Drake Circus will come into in a moment. So just be aware, although it's called a regeneration project, technically it's, it's a redevelopment. The areas in red on this map are uh, areas that are um, earmarked for redevelopment or regeneration throughout this project. Uh, for Vision Plymouth, you can certainly see it's a city-wide project, a whole range of um, different activities to take place here. We'll go through the range here, the second bullet point, um, your shopping centres, a cruise terminal, park and ride, etc. There's the idea to raise population to 300,000 by 2030. Your top bullet point, um, it's a top-down redevelopment. What that means is it's um, local government-led. It's not the residents doing it themselves, as um, you may well have seen in the Daharavi example in Mumbai. This is a top-down redevelopment, uh, but private industry there. Now, private industry is a business, essentially, one that's doing it to, to make a profit. These are the driving forces behind this change for Plymouth, this redevelopment of the whole city. Final point there, the scale of regeneration or redevelopment taking place is second only to the post-war reconstruction period uh, following on from the blitz that hopefully you've seen in the first video. So one of the big questions the spec asks is why did Plymouth need redevelopment? Uh, hopefully you did this diamond ranking activity once upon a time in your books. If not, I've put it up on the board anyway. Uh, Plymouth throughout the 1990s faced a number of social, economic and even environmental challenges. And as a result of that, uh, that's what's led to the need for redevelopment. Taking these numbers in turn, if we start with number one, it actually links to several other ones, a decline in the defence sector. Jobs in, in Devonport and the rebuilding of submarines, as an example, began to decline in the UK as a whole, but particularly hit Plymouth during the early 90s. As a result of that, you start ending up with high levels of unemployment. Those, pre those previous employed people have lost their job and therefore uh, you have high levels of unemployment, which obviously are real negative for the city. People out of work will inevitably have less disposable income. Therefore, they're going to spend less in the local economy. And therefore, um, you have that knock on effect of, of businesses closing down. Furthermore, people being out of work obviously links to uh, number two, difficult to attack private investment and three um, the low levels of entrepreneurship people looked uh, just before I do that entrepreneurship is, is risk-taking in this instance it's opening a business as an example 
when uh, businesses look at Plymouth in the 1990s, they see a large population out of work. Uh, at one point in the early 90s, it's, it's estimated to be around about 30% of people in Plymouth are, are not employed. With that as a figure, businesses are put off moving there on the basis they don't believe they'll make any profit, as the people of Plymouth don't have enough disposable income to spend in the shops to keep them profitable. And as a result, we end up with um, your, your initial point number one leading to two, three and four. Slightly separate is number five, growth of regional airports. In the early 90s, uh, sorry, I should say in the mid 90s, airports like Newquay and Exeter began offering more flights. I certainly remember getting a flight to London from Newquay Airport in the late 90s. And as a result of that, people from Cornwall, your 500,000 residents of Cornwall, would actually jump on a flight and fly to London to do shopping rather than go to Plymouth. And as a result, that would further decrease the income of the city. Low incomes and low skills, again, links to people being out of work. Number seven, poor transport links, congestion into the city. Yeah, um, this was this is a real, real issue, uh, actually, for, for many cities across the UK. The transport links um, were essentially not changed from beyond the 1960s, and the increase in car ownership during that period of time meant that the city became very, very congested. A congested city and a uh, poor public service image of the buses that I'll come to later in the video simply means that people didn't travel to Plymouth, they wouldn't go shopping in Plymouth and as a result of that would, would not spend in the city. Number eight, um, urban decay. Now this one is actually almost the, the end point of the first seven. Urban decay, remember, is where areas of city fall into dereliction. This is, it applies in the CBD but at, at Devonport as well. People not shopping the CBD means businesses close, they move somewhere else, and as a result, you have an empty shop. If businesses don't believe that there'll be enough shoppers, another business won't open in that shop, so the area becomes vacant. As a result of a vacant shop, it's more likely to get vandalised, graffiti, etc., on the basis that people are less likely to prosecute, and as a result of that, the area quite quickly uh, becomes an area which is an eyesore and falls into decay or dereliction. Outdated and ugly CBD architecture, yeah, this is a revolutionary CBD in the 1960s. However, uh, by the 1990s, the utilitarian architecture could arguably be putting people off the city. And as a result of that, people don't shop in the city and it becomes uh, another to, to number eight there. If you were to get a question regarding Plymouth's need for a redevelopment or the aims of redevelopment, I think urban decay is a really nice one to pick as it's almost like the end point of the other uh, eight factors up on the board. So Plymouth, real, real challenges in the 1990s, socially and economically. That's why you have an element of the city. Just to show you this concept of urban decay, Drake Circus, uh, not as you know it, is the top two images here in 1995. Hopefully you can identify that this area is a dark area. You've got stagnant puddles of water. You've got uh, quite an ugly architecture. And the business here are really struggling to get enough footfall. Shoppers are put off this area because it's dark, they don't feel safe in the area, and as a result of that, you've got more and more businesses closing down, we see a number of empty shops there. Furthermore, it's very difficult to advertise this area, I mean, look at the image on the right, it's, it's not something you can sell as, as a shopping district, as a vibrant area, because the buildings are very, very, very ugly, and as a result of that, people simply aren't going there, and, and the businesses and the shops are closing. Looking at Devonport below, this is your inner city uh, area, this is... Um, just the image just to show this is kind of like utilitarian architecture. It's not there to look pretty, it's there to simply do the job. And as a result of that, people don't necessarily treat the area as, as well as perhaps they, they would do with a different type of architecture, and the area becomes run down quickly. The council also has a lack of money at this time due to a fall in rents coming in from the CBD and a fall in tax being paid by CBD businesses. It simply doesn't have the money to invest in things like paint jobs here or um, services to... to to cut the grass back. I mean, we've got a very, very, very large weed growing out of the pavement, what, what appears to be a weed growing out there, and the area just falls into disrepair as a result. The roads become damaged and they don't get filled in, is another example. So Plymouth really struggling in the mid-90s uh, through this problem of urban decay. So the Vision Plymouth scheme um, starts really in the early 2000s and then uh, really picks up pace uh, recently, actually. The four aims or four projects we're going to study there, Drake Circus, Parker Ride, Ocean Gates and the Bickley Eco Homes. 
if you get an exam question on a redevelopment, it's very, very likely to ask you to uh, evaluate or discuss or, or to ask you to what extent it has been successful. When we consider a redevelopment, we always have to try and consider what the actual aim of the four projects were, and then we can work out if it was a success or not. Obviously, there are going to be winners and losers from all four of these projects, and it's really important we can name those as a group of people. But crucially to remember, the only way you can actually judge success is if the project is sustainable aka it will work now it'll work in the future it means people of today can meet their needs but it won't compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs so looking at these four projects we'll take them all in turn we'll ask the question what was the aim we'll consider the winners losers and then try and make a judgment over whether it was successful and we'll do an overall conclusion of the entire vision plymouth um, schemes at the end of this video there's your sustainability stool, which I forgot to mention in the top right hand corner. When we consider sustainability, social, economic, environmental, uh, always to look at. Right, we'll start with Drake Circus, your facts and figures there in the bottom. A £170 million covered shopping mall uh, developed by the company there uh, in, in, a, um, in conjunction with Plymouth City Council. Open in 2006, it's going to be a very, very important date for us in this video. Right, the aim of Drake Circus, number one, is to attract more shoppers into Plymouth. Number two, uh, to attract high-end chain stores. Number three, it's to try and open more shops in the rest of Plymouth. Now, that one might sound a bit strange. The idea is if you drag more shoppers to Drake Circus, then you have more shoppers in the CBD, therefore more footfall for the rest of the business in the CBD. So, therefore, hopefully those businesses will, will continue to, to, one, stay alive, but two, open new businesses as well. Fourthly, uh, to try and improve the aesthetics of the CBD, we've seen some of those utilitarian images uh, of the rest of the CBD. We want this area to stand out, to be uh, a building that people want to go and see and want to go and visit. And I suppose number five, uh, sort of the culmination, is to reduce urban decay. So of those five aims, have, uh, how has Drake Circus achieved them? Um, has Drake Circus pulled in more shoppers? Well, the answer is yes. Um, in terms of their full, their car park at Drake Circus, they report around about 90% of the spaces are taken at any one time throughout the year as an average. So that is dragging more shoppers into the CBD. Has it attracted high-end chain stores? Well, yes. In Drake Circus, we have uh, Primark and we have an Apple store, which were not, in, well, sorry, were not in Plymouth before that date. So they've pulled those shops into Plymouth. Also, we've got a very large Next in, in, the, in the mall itself as well. Just to go back to more shoppers, obviously the fact it's undercover means you've dragged more shoppers in when it's raining. Previously, when it was raining, the only undercover shopping area in Plymouth was the market. And as a result of that, people would be put off coming to the CBD when it was raining. You put a cover or a roof over this, people are therefore more inclined to come and visit. Um, third one was open more shops in the rest of Plymouth. Has this been successful for, on that aim? Um, partially, yes, actually, in Upper Plymouth. Um, so that would be Upper New George Street and Upper Cornwall Street. Only 8% of shops are, are currently closed, what we call the void rate. 8% of shops are currently vacant. Now, with that in mind, in a national perspective, that pretty much is the national average for closed shops across any city. So Drake Circus, you can probably argue it's been a partial success because Plymouth, a city that was really struggling in the 1990s, now has an equal void rate with any other given city in, in the UK as an average. I've said partially there because in Lower Plymouth, uh, the area furthest away from Drake Circus in, in the CBD, from your um, field trip, if you want to imagine Market Avenue as an example, 20% of shops in Market Avenue are void today in 2018. So one in five shops is vacant. Now, we can't necessarily say that Drake Circus is the only cause of that, but there is an argument using your pedestrian count from your field work, actually, that Drake Circus does certainly pull shoppers to Upper Plymouth. With that in mind, there are less shoppers in Lower Plymouth, and that therefore means that those shops get less footfall, and as a result of that, they are more inclined to close. They just simply don't make enough money to pay, to pay the rents. Has it improved the aesthetics? Well, it's certainly a very unique building. Uh, it does certainly stand out in Plymouth. Um, in 2006, it did win the Carbuncle Cup, which is uh, an award given for crimes against architecture in the UK. So 
you know, I guess this one, I guess with anything that's um, personal opinion, you can argue either way successfully. Um, up to you on that one. I would probably say it, it certainly looks more interesting than the rest of the uh, CBD, which very utilitarian, very 1960s. Has it reduced urban decay? Well, partially, yes. In Upper Plymouth, you'd probably argue it, it has. It's an interesting looking building and the void rate is equal to any other city in the UK. Arguably, on the other hand, though, in Lower Plymouth, I think there's an argument to suggest that perhaps this, this has not achieved that aim as more shops have closed. So who are your winners from Drake Circus? Your winners are your residents of Plymouth for two reasons, really. One, there's more jobs created um, in Plymouth. Uh, any name job here, security guard, cleaner, shop assistant, managers, all of those jobs have been created in Plymouth. So therefore you have less unemployed people or less neats if you'd like to give them that term. That therefore means they have more disposable income and more access to opportunities, e.g. spending within Plymouth as an example, so a higher quality of life. It also massively improves the quality of life of um, the business owners in Upper Plymouth as well. Those people now have higher footfall, they have more money being spent, which means that the business has more disposable income. Uh, and as a result of that, they can reinvest in their service. The council as well, um, on the basis of that, the council are also big winners because of the increase in taxes and the increase in rents paid in Plymouth when we compare to the 1990s. That therefore means you could then argue that the residents of Plymouth win as well on the basis that uh, the council can reinvest more money into the aesthetics of the CBD. Right, the losers. Um, you could probably argue the residents during the building, there was a lot of noise and congestion. If there's congestion with trucks going to the area, that reduces the residents' um, leisure time, therefore, because the journeys will be longer, therefore reduces access to opportunities, e.g. I don't know, going swimming, so therefore a lower quality of life. Shop owners in Lower Plymouth, particularly Market Avenue, another group of people you could argue are your losers here. They have a reduced footfall on the basis that Drake Circus is pulling people to Upper Plymouth and therefore their shops make less money. They have less disposable income. They have less access to opportunities, e.g. reinvesting in their business. So a lower quality of life. Now, the big question then, um, is it sustainable? Um, this is the awkward one. In terms of the state of the high street in the UK and the advent and the increasing uh, popularity of internet shopping, there is an argument that any city centre redevelopment is, is potentially unsustainable now on the basis that every city across the UK is seeing a decline in footfall on the basis that more and more people shop online. With that in mind, you could actually argue that the future is uncertain for Drake Circus. However, at present, it's certainly meeting its objectives for the most part. So you can argue either way on that point. There's number one done. That's Drake Circus. Move on to number two, which I believe is the Park and Ride. Yes, it is. The Park and Ride. Um, I said we'd mention the buses here. Um, the buses in Plymouth in the early 90s or mid 90s and late 90s as well, really, had quite a poor reputation for um, services. They, they were uncomfortable. They were damaged. They were out of date buses. With that in mind, the park and ride scheme extended in the late 90s also introduces a uh, fleet of new buses in 2006 to try and encourage people to use it. Uh, the buses, just to identify what they have, they have security cameras, they have leather seats, they have Wi-Fi, they have USB charging points. It's any way whatsoever they can try and get people to use these buses. Now, the aim of this project is to attract more shoppers to Plymouth City Centre and to also reduce congestion. Congestion, a big challenge, remember, that the city had in the early 90s. So let's have a little look at this. Have we achieved these aims? Uh, has the park and ride attracted more shoppers to Plymouth on the basis they can park in one of the three terminals you can see on the board here, one in the north, one in the southeast, one in the southwest. Uh, they can park easier, jump on the bus and get in more conveniently. Now, has this system worked? Well, it's difficult to say that, I mean, there's certainly more shoppers in the CBD of Plymouth than there have been in the past. However, how much of that we can say is actually the C, uh, sorry, the park and ride uh, is difficult. But we can certainly argue, yes, because there are more shoppers, how much the park and rides contributed. I mean, that's that's debatable. Has uh, the park and ride reduced congestion? Well, yes, actually, in the inner city, there's been a 4% reduction in traffic. Um, since the park and ride was introduced that really is a, a real achievement here that shows that people must be using the park and ride on the basis that um, there are less cars on the road 
uh, but yet more people are going to CBD. So that is a real, real success of the project. However, it's only a partial success when you consider the congestion in the suburbs has actually increased by 9%. People trying to access these bus terminals have actually congested the roads in the suburbs. So actually, in terms of reducing uh, congestion, it's a partial success. Yes, in the inner city, but actually the opposite effect in, in the outer city or the suburbs. So who are your winners? Uh, your commuters, firstly, um, they have faster, cheaper travel on the basis that they no longer have to drive in the CBD and pay for parking. They drive a less of a distance and pay uh, a relatively cheap fare to jump on the park and ride bus and take them into the CBD. So your commuters are big winners. Furthermore, they, are, they can actually work on the bus now, so they're more productive, you could argue. You could argue they have more leisure time on the basis that they get more work done on the way to work, which previously, when they're in the car, they, they simply wouldn't have been able to do. Another group of people who win, uh, other than commuters, is other road users in the inner city. Uh, they might be people who are leaving the city centre in the morning, as an example. 4% uh, less traffic means faster journeys, it means more leisure time, uh, more access to opportunities. Uh, just always name an example with access to opportunities, I know, going swimming, and therefore a higher quality of life. Your negatives, there are losers here as well. Your residents in the suburbs are big, big, big losers on the basis of more congestion. Uh, their journey times will be slower, so you just flip the, the opposite one there. Uh, less access to opportunities, e.g. going swimming. The other one is it's going to be very, very noisy out in the um, suburbs now, whereas previously that wouldn't have been the case. Now we have more traffic and a bus terminal that opens at around about 7 o'clock every day. Very, very noisy, less likely to have a lie-in, more stressed, less comfortable, a lower quality of life. Now the one that I'll throw in just before we talk about sustainability is the cost. Per day, the Park and Ride in Plymouth loses £837 a day. That is a huge amount of money when you consider it over a 10 year period. As a result of that, the argument is that quite simply that this is a loss making project. Now you can flip this and actually say that the money you lose on running the buses will actually be recouped on the basis that more people will be shopping and those people in a day would spend more than £837. However, the the, uh, the bold figure, the black and bold figure here is an £837 loss a day. When we therefore consider sustainability, I think from an environmental point of view, you could probably argue that this has been successful on the basis that you have less cars on the road, less carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide emissions, therefore a reduced effect of the enhanced greenhouse effect. Socially, again, you could probably argue this has been successful as people may well end up with more leisure time. Although, don't get me wrong, you're all going to have groups of people that may actually end up with less leisure time like the people living in the suburbs. But probably for the majority of people using the inner city, that they've probably benefited. The big negative, and this is probably why you can argue it's not sustainable, is the economic loss. So has the park and ride been successful? Yes, environmentally. Yes, socially. But possibly not so much economically. Part three, Ocean's Gate, um, the UK's first marine enterprise zone. Marine meaning related to the sea, obviously. Uh, an enterprise zone, um, what that means is it's a, a zone where you're trying to encourage businesses to open. Uh, you have a reduced tax, you have a low rent for the uh, city council here. Um, the area is built on its former Ministry of Defence land. Uh, it's in Devonport with deep water access. Real, real key there is the deep water access. That's the reason Ocean Gates is here. You can get directly out into the ocean very, very, very quickly. The site itself is built on 35 hectares of land. So what's the aim of Ocean Gate? Well, Ocean Gate is going to try and reduce urban decay, as all the other projects are going to try and do. You're going to really try and keep those skilled workers from Plymouth University. You're going to try and keep your graduates in the city. That will therefore increase the disposable income in the city, increase the wealth of the city, and therefore the argument is that will try and attract new businesses into Plymouth. It will essentially create the positive multiplier effect. Now one little piece of exam advice here. If you're going to use positive multiplier effect in an exam, well done first of all, However, make sure you put all the steps in first. Don't just say OceanGate is trying to achieve the positive multiplier effect, full stop, because that won't get you any marks. Tell me how you're going to do that. So in terms of OceanGate, you're going to try and keep your skilled workforce by creating highly skilled tertiary and quaternary jobs. That therefore means you keep your graduates, so your graduates spend more money in the local economy, so um, the local economy, uh, your shops and businesses pay more tax, so Plymouth City Council has more money to invest in services, therefore 
uh, e.g., I should say, I don't know, flower beds in the city centre. That makes it more aesthetically pleasing. That then affects or attracts more customers to the CBD, and therefore you start getting your the idea of the positive multiplier effect as more people then spend again, and the government ends up with more tax. So has uh, Ocean Gate achieved this rather large aim of keeping skilled workers? Uh, well, yeah, actually, it's probably achieved all of them. This might be the most successful of the three projects for you, or four projects, I should say, for you to argue in the exam. Just to start with, um, this is built on a brownfield site, so straight away you've got an environmental argument here that you're not building a greenfield site, you're not destroying habitats, uh, and as a result of that, uh, your dormouse is a lovely example there, is, is, not, is not affected, the food web, the ecosystem not affected. It is going to keep those Plymouth graduates. The best evidence of that is within the site, there's going to be a thousand new flats added um, to the area for, for essentially for these highly skilled graduates. If you can keep your graduates, they're going to spend in the local economy. And that's what you need. They Plymouth don't need a return to the 1990s of low skills and a high unemployment. With that in mind, um, your graduates stay, particularly those doing marine biology and oceanography, they are going to have those highly skilled jobs. It's going to benefit the other businesses, both in Devonport and also the CBD as well. Now, there are some negatives. You've got to have increased traffic into Devonport and more congestion. And you've got a question of environmental sustainability on the basis of more boats using Plymouth Sound, that deep water access, and the potential for uh, the interference in the marine ecosystem. However, I think that was probably negated on the basis that these are the experts who are going to going and using this. And on that basis, actually, you'd hope that they're going to be uh, considering sustainability in every action that they take. So I think... In my opinion, Ocean Gate is a great project. It's certainly one that I'd be using in the exam to argue that this has been very, very successful at Plymouth, maintaining, keeping those graduates in the city. Okay, the final section of the Vision Plymouth uh, redevelopment project that we're going to look at is the Bickley or Roborough eco, eco Homes. These are located on the Green Belt, uh, north of Plymouth, about six miles from the central business district. In total, including apartments, this is going to have 85 plots when completed. Some of the features there of the houses up on the board, I'll talk through a couple of those in a moment. Um, the big aim here is to provide affordable housing to an increasing population. Remember by 2030, we're considering or estimating that 300,000 people are going to live in Plymouth. These people are going to need more houses to live in, and this is the idea of building out into the green belt, that area of protected land around the city, to try and provide uh, those people accommodation. Second aim, we're going to try and reduce carbon emissions uh, of the city itself and also any new building. And also we're going to try and revitalise this northern area of Plymouth, e.g. Uh, Bickley. Now, this time we're actually going to go through the winners and losers first before we do the, the overall consideration. So in terms of uh, your positive of this project, they are eco-friendly houses. Um, they have triple glazing, or you could also, the other specific there is 30 centimetres worth of insulation in these buildings. As a result of that, you have uh, less need to put heat on in winter, therefore less fossil fuels are burnt, uh, therefore reducing carbon emissions, and that will therefore reduce the effectiveness of the enhanced greenhouse effect. So in terms of um, just simply the, the houses themselves, they will achieve that aim of reducing carbon emissions. In addition, uh, one of the other aims was to provide more housing. Well, that has been achieved. There is more housing provided. The concept here linking to affordability is if you end up with more houses in an area that should reduce house prices as there is more uh, choice and therefore it becomes uh, less of a seller's market and gives uh, buyers more, more of a choice where they, they want to, to buy. A big group of people here uh, who win are the current residents of Plymouth who are looking maybe as a first time buyer on the basis that if house prices decrease that means uh, people can, can continue to live in the area um, uh, they'll actually also have more disposable income to improve the house they may be able to afford a bigger house as well um, has it revitalized North Plymouth? Well, yeah, probably. I mean, there's more people in the local area, so that's going to keep your services open, e.g. Uh, Bickley Inn, as, as a little example there. That's more likely to stay open on the basis that you have more customers in the area. However, there are some big, big, big negatives. Um, this is built on a greenfield site as opposed to the brownfield site that Ocean Gate was built on. 
The greenfield site is going to destroy habitats, that, for example, the dormouse, and therefore uh, negatively affect the sparrow hawk and the wolf spider in, in the future as well. It destabilizes that, that ecosystem, that food web. In addition, in terms of trying to revitalize the north, you'll have the negative of adding more congestion to the north on the basis that more uh, cars will be on the road there. Furthermore, in terms of house affordability and house prices, um, a three-bedroom house, I looked this up this morning, is, is going to be about £300,000, which in terms of Plymouth is a very, very, very high figure. The argument is that these houses have not been as affordable as, as you would have hoped, although they are in high demand. Is it providing more housing to Plymouth? Yes. However, it's only providing 85 plots, which isn't a huge amount considering um, the actual needs of the city to go uh, up around about 40,000 people. So it is only small scale. So in terms of um, the Bickley homes, have they been successful? Probably from a social perspective, uh, in terms of Bickley, the village, probably yes, because there are more people using the services there. However, as a negative, um, economically, they are very, very expensive houses in terms of the entire city. So there is an argument that perhaps these are, this is out of the range of people, uh, first time buyers, which was the intention. And therefore, actually, maybe it's not socially and economically sustainable environmentally you can certainly argue that the solar panels or the 30 centimeter insulation or the triple glazing makes these houses e eco-friendly and will reduce carbon emissions however you've also got that flip that negative of building on a greenfield site so Bickley I mean I'll leave it up to you there's arguments on either side you can either argue it has or has not been successful using those arguments we've talked through um the big conclusion then if you're writing this sentence you if you're sorry, writing the sentence, writing this um, answer, I should say. If it's a to what extent and evaluate or discuss, you're going to need to conclude at the end. So my sentence would lead in with overall vision Plymouth redevelopment is currently meeting the aim set out for it. And I think we could probably agree that Drake Circus, Park and Ride, Ocean's Gate and Bickley Ecohomes are, are achieving the aims they've been set out for. However, the problem is how long this will last into the future. I've identified two of the major concerns there, the health of the high street in the UK on the basis of more internet shopping and simply the day-to-day -day running costs of the park and ride might mean that these projects actually become unsustainable in the future. A real top level uh, conclusion here as you're showing balance whilst also making a decision. So a very, very long video, over 32 minutes. Um, come and see us down at H7 if you've got any further questions about the Plymouth regeneration.